I uh, would like to ask for your forgiveness before we begin. I will occasionally consult this infernal and inelegant device here. I'm not texting or tweeting. I'm simply reading notes <laughs> in a somewhat postmodern manner. Um, I, I, the introduction, Zenia, was very beautiful, and thank you for it. I, I have nothing to add except for um, noting uh, that <coughs> Lily's book that was highly recommended to me by, by people I trust and love uh, hit me uh, like like a great rock album does. Uh, this is not a book that uh, invites you to sip tea politely on the couch. This is a book that invites you to, to, to howl. Uh, and, and not very many novels do that. And I envy you the pleasure of reading it for the first time. Uh, and and uh, very dearly welcome the opportunity to talk to you uh, tonight. Lily, here's a question. Um, so Lola was born in a DP camp uh, and then emigrated to Australia, um, found herself uh, getting into rock journalism when she was young, traveled to England, uh, interviewed some of the leading lights of, of pop music at the time, Paul McCartney, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix. In other words, she is nothing like Lily Brett. <laughs> it's worryingly parallel, really. No, I did do just that. That's what I did. I was very, very young. I was 19 and I was extremely lucky to get this job um, because I hadn't finished high school. It was my big act of rebellion. My father wanted me to be a lawyer and it's very hard to rebel against two people who've been in Nazi death camps, who've been in prison for six years. Um, it's really hard to be rebellious and all I did was go to see Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, twice instead of sitting for the public exams. <laughs> and that guaranteed failure. So um, I couldn't be Perry Mason. And I had to get a job and I was extremely lucky to get this job because I went to the job interview and they didn't ask me if I could write, which was just as well, because I might have said, I don't know. And um, instead they asked me if I had a car. <laughs> <laughs> and my father was really convinced that all Australian boys got drunk, which most of them did, and drove at the same time. And so he bought me a second-hand car because he thought I'd be much safer driving myself. And I said, oh, yes, I have a car, a pink Valiant. And the editors went away and conferred. And less than five minutes later, they said, can you start tomorrow? <laughs> And to this day, I'm still friendly with one of them. He swears they thought I was very clever. But I had to go in to the secretary um, and ask her when nobody was looking how to load paper into the typewriter and then beg her not to tell anyone that I had asked. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd never seen a tape recorder. We were very poor. Um, it took me quite a while to work out how to use it. It was real to real, <laughs> but I was just very, very lucky. And then, very shortly after that, I did travel um, to London. I li worked in London for six months, and then I m went to New York and LA and Monterey. And it didn't occur to me that fronting up to people and saying, "Oh, uh, I work for the Australian rock music magazine Go Set." was anything less than utterly impressive. Um, in America, they had not heard of Australia. People asked me what language we spoke. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, considering I grew up with parents who didn't speak English and I wasn't born in the country, I thought my English... That's a fair question, yeah. No, but I thought my English was pretty good <laughs> until I came to America. So before we get to, to your, to your uh, illustrious time uh, on, on these hallowed coasts, um, this is this is your 16th book? Yeah, it's my 16th book. I really like the numbers. So what 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 took you so long to bring Lola Bensky? Well, I had a lot of other books to write and people who knew about my life always knew about this part of my life and people would say, "Why don't you write about it?" And I don't know why I didn't write about it. Um 
I think I didn't want to face that time in my life. I was 19 and I think I just didn't want to face it. But I did um, sign a contract to write a, a book about it and I had a lot of notes and I put them in manila folders, 10 manila folders, and I bound each folder with an elastic band and then I bound all 10 folders together with a very big <laughs> elastic band and then I zipped it up in a small satchel and then I put the small satchel inside a brown travel bag and then I put the brown travel bag inside a steel metal drawer of a filing cabinet and it stayed there. And I used to walk past it and look at my notes every now and then and think, oh well, they're still there. And I just couldn't face it um, until one day my German publisher rang up to say Happy New Year to me and I could tell that wasn't really why he'd called me. <laughs> and after saying he just wanted to know how I am and there was no pressure about anything else, when he said it for about the tenth time, I admitted that my notes were locked up. <coughs> and so I then decided I'd give myself three months to write to start writing or to dump the book and I'd never dumped a book and once I started I didn't stop. I virtually stayed inside for about 11 months and wrote day and night and I'm I'm not sure why I found it so hard to face and I should know because I've spent half my adult life and three quarters of my income on psychoanalysis <laughs> And you would think that I would understand a few things, but it didn't extend to why I found this novel so bothering. <laughs> it wasn't so bothering once I'd started. I started with Jimi Hendrix and I was off. Um, let's talk about Hendrix then. Um, before we do, there is, I think, a somewhat astonishing revelation, which is Lola, and I take it you, don't particularly care for rock and roll. No, Lola wasn't interested in the music. She was just writing about music because that was the job that she got. And she, and she also found that the music was very loud. I mean, if you have to go to... <laughs> well, rock concerts are very loud. <coughs> and she had very sensitive hearing. And if you have to go to rock concerts night after night after night and you don't really care for the music, um, I used to, and I was always given seats for in, near the front, and I used to try to put my fingers in my ears as, and pretend to just be nonchalant instead of trying to drown it out. <laughs> I used to review the records according to how interesting the lyrics were. <laughs> but it, it gave me a distinct advantage in a way because I was not in awe of anyone Right. Because I didn't like you, the music. You were, you were the, the metaphysical rock critic of, yes, of your time. Yes, in a sense. You know, if someone had told me to report on cars, I probably would have known just as much about cars, right. and I know nothing about cars. And so Jimi Hendrix is probably a good introduction to this. Tell us, tell us about Lola's encounter with him, which I think is a, is a perfect example of, of how this particular genre of rock journalism works. Well, I... When I first saw Jimi Hendrix, it was in a very small club in London. For somebody who didn't like the music, I had an unerring sense of who was going to do well and who wasn't. I'm not sure how that happened, but um, I was sitting very close to the stage and after about 10 minutes, I was absolutely terrified because I knew I had to go to his dressing room when the performance finished. And I had never, ever seen a man move like that, on stage or off stage. <laughs> I, I didn't know men could move like that. I didn't know anyone could move like that. <laughs> and I was terrified. I mean, you have to remember that today everybody's humping a, you know, guitar or a microphone. But when he moved his hips, I felt the sense of terror. <laughs> And it was one of the very few times where I was actually very frightened of going into anyone's dressing room. I mean, I've seen half the rock world in their underwear and was not frightened at all. But I went in and, first of all, 
I had to sit on a bar stool as Lola did and I hate stools. I always felt like a big mushroom sitting on top of them. <laughs> and to my enormous surprise I was trying to pretend I was comfortable and Lola was trying to pretend she was very comfortable. Jimi Hendrix was incredibly softly spoken and very, very concerned about me. I must have looked really frightened, but I think he was just a very sensitive man. He had, he had such a gentle voice. And he kept asking Lola, was Lola comfortable? And Lola was very, very tubby. And she used to wear fishnet tights. I'm not sure why, because they were not flattering. And they dug into her thighs, so she would pad the inside of the fishnet tights with Kleenex tissues, which slowly started disintegrating <laughs> when it was hot. <laughs> so Lola was sitting on her bar stool with this little shower of tissues falling to the floor. <laughs> and Jimi Hendrix kept saying, are you comfortable? And <laughs> Lola said, oh yes. <laughs> and asking him the next question. but. I really, really found him to be very, very satisfying to interview because I knew that he'd suffered a lot. I knew he'd had a very tough childhood and I, he listened so carefully to what I said and I asked him about his mother and father. This was in the days when celebrity journalism was in its infancy and the sort of questions that people asked rock stars in those days and the people asking the questions, the journalists, were almost always men. There were hardly any women. There were hardly any women in the rock world, you know. The, all the managers were men, the publicists were men and the rock stars were men. Um, and the sort of questions they asked were, what's your favourite colour? sort of a bit bewildering why anyone would want to know that or worse what did you eat for breakfast <laughs> and I was asking him a lot of questions about religion a lot of I asked everybody how they got on with their mother because I was clearly having trouble with mine and so was Lola mm -hmm. and and Cat Stevens gave you a, a particularly evocative answer or gave Lola a particularly evocative well Cat Stevens was just wise beyond his years I, I know he changed later in life but he was a very very clever and he was younger than I was so when I was 19 he was 18 and he gave me a very, very involved answer, or he gave Lola a very involved answer about getting on with his parents and how he was much better at it than he used to be. And we discussed um, difficult mothers, as I did with uh, Jimi Hendrix. Um, and also, Jimi Hendrix and I had uh, an issue in common, which I didn't realise when I was watching him perform, is we both had curly hair and he was very very interested in how to manage curly hair <laughs> <laughs> and so was I <laughs> so we we got on very very well he carried his own set of hair curlers everywhere with him and I was wildly impressed and so not not to uh, bring everyone down uh, but then there was one other thing uh, that, that Lola discusses with Jimi Hendrix, which is the Holocaust. Uh, and when, when the book was introduced to me, um, someone said, you have to read this book. It's by this Australian writer named Lily Brett. It's about rock and roll and the Holocaust. And these two things, and I'd like to ask you many more questions about it, but these two things, once you begin to read the encounters, they don't seem weird at all. No, and I think they, they weren't weird when you consider that the people that I chose to dwell on in Lola Bensky were one way or another people who had suffered in their lives. I mean, I focused on Jimi Hendrix, on Janis Joplin, on Mama Cass, on Brian Jones. Mick Jagger hadn't really suffered. He'd had a very straightforward upbringing. Mm. But I think also... Um, the fact that I was born to two people who had each survived Nazi death camps. And it's 
it's not easy to grow up the child of people who've been through such trauma. My mother had a mother and father, four brothers, three sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, nephews and nieces. Every one of them was murdered. And my mother was 17 when she was first imprisoned in the lodge ghetto. And my father lost all but one of his family members. And I think that makes you acutely sensitive to other people's pain and suffering. And when Jimi Hendrix talked a lot about feeling alone and being abandoned and getting on with parents. And so Lola finds herself talking about her own parents, which was something she didn't do, and certainly not to her colleagues and not to her friends. And Jimi Hendrix is very, very thoughtful. I mean, he understands what a burden that sort of upbringing would be. So about three hours later, I was supposed to do an hour. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix and I parted ways <laughs> with him uh, arranging possibly to see Lola later on. <laughs> <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> I never would have gone to meet him later on. Uh, I don't know if you've heard David, your husband, asked, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was always on guard for other men. <laughs> um, at, at, at the risk of, of, of sounding vulgar, do you think there might be some kind of correlation as the, as the daughter of two Holocaust survivors who grew up with this, with this uh, tale of you know, a moment in time in which a cultured society disintegrated into you know, this savagery, um, to arrive at another moment in time, and I'm obviously not making any correlation, but in which the cultural moment called for this rock and roll, orgiastic, messianic, complete explosion of id. Uh, does, does Lola understand them better because she, she had seen this, this wildness? Well, I think what happened was when Lola got to the Monterey Pop Festival, which was in 1967, she thought she was witnessing a revolution. Everybody at the festival was smiling. There was huge happiness in the audience. And it wasn't the sort of happiness that you see at a football match, not that I've ever been to one, <laughs> but it's what I imagine you see at a football match where people are wildly happy because their team is winning or the other team is losing. This was a very, very simple happiness and I thought that I really was witnessing a revolution. I knew that the world could change overnight because overnight it had changed massively for my mother and father and millions of other people. So I knew it could change for the worse. And, and at Monterey Pop Festival with everyone wearing flowers in their hair and you know, dressed in matching outfits to their dogs. I real and, and you know, give, giving away everything free. Um, I really thought I was witnessing a revolution. I had a slight hint, or more than a slight hint, that this revolution might have a dark side. Um, when I, I was sitting with the performers, because I was just lucky enough to have met. Um, the right people who thought I was young and naive enough to need help and who helped me get to the right places at the right times. I was sitting with the performers and I was sitting next to Mama Cass and Lola has a very funny encounter with Mama Cass, with, with Janice. I was sitting next to Janice Joplin and two seats away from Mama Cass and Lola turns to Janice Joplin and she says, can I ask you a weird question? And Janice Joplin says, I love weird questions. <laughs> And Lola says, a am I as fat as Mama Cass? <laughs> and Janice Joplin leans forward very obviously and scrutinises Mama Cass from one end of her to the other and then says in a l voice that Lola thought might be loud enough for Mama Cass to hear, oh, hell no. <laughs> and then I started to talk to Janice Joplin um, and we started talking about our anxieties. I, I bet I was the only journalist in the world sharing my anxieties with Janice Joplin. And we, we both were talking about a sense of loss and a sense of not fitting in and difficult mothers. Difficult mothers is always a great subject to bond <laughs> over. And 
a, a few hours later, she was telling me she got a, a big bottle of Southern Comfort out of her bag, and I had a feeling it was alcoholic. <laughs> I, 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 I never had a drink in my life. And um, she said to me, this is going to help you. Um, and then she said, have you ever had speed? And I said, oh, once when I was 15 and I couldn't sleep for days. And she said, what about heroin? And I said, oh, no. And she said, that, that will help you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought, she said she always carried a bottle, she carried a handbag big enough to house a bottle and a book. And I thought the book might be harmless and even helpful, but I was a little worried about the bottle of whiskey. I think it's bourbon. I don't know the difference, actually. Um, and what else was happening around me was drugs. People were passing pills up and down the, r the rows as though they were hors d'oeuvres. And... I felt quite embarrassed, Leo, because I was a very polite Australian. I said, oh, no, thank you, no, thank <laughs> you, and heaved a huge sigh of relief when Mama Cass sent some watermelon down the line, because <laughs> I could say yes. And after about the third day, when I could, you could really see, I mean, I... Lola interviewed Brian Jones and so did I when he was so stoned and we were sitting side by side on a bench and there were no minders, there were no PR people, there was no one to tell you what to say and what not to say and he started leaning towards me and <laughs> then was actually leaning on me and I realised was not just having trouble answering the question, he was passed out. <laughs> 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 And I thought he was dying and didn't know what to do and I couldn't see anybody who could help me. And so I was trying to prop him up and eventually two guys came along and said, oh shit, he's high again, he's off his head. And I thought, oh, I thought it was a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I started to be able to see and it quite frightened me was that I came from a community of people Australia has the highest number of Holocaust survivors per capita outside Israel and I grew up living in one room with my parents in a row house in which, which had eight rooms and a different family in each room and we shared the kitchen and the bathroom quite happily from my memory. Um, and these people were people who were struggling to stay alive. I mean they were struggling with the most appalling memories terrible nightmares. My mother woke up two or three times a night screaming in her sleep in Yiddish for her mother. Did her mother know she was trying to follow her to the gas? And so this was a community who was really struggling to be alive and I was in the middle of a community that was hurtling towards their death and I don't think any of them knew that they were going to die because at that age you think you're going to live forever. But part of me just knew that all, those dr all the drugs and the drink was really dangerous. Um, when I interviewed John and Michelle Phillips, I went to their house. I was always in people's houses, which is really what you could do in those days. And they had a huge jar of mixed pills and said, oh, please have some. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you read... Um not just celebrity journalism, but journalism in general today, which consists, and I hope I'm not spoiling anyone's fun here, of, you know, say 25 minutes uh, to an hour and a half in a room filled with, you know, three publicists, two, you know, crisis communication specialists and eight personal assistants. What, what, what how, at the risk of sounding too far, how does that make you feel? Well, I think what it does is it's not how it makes me feel, it's what you end up reading, and you end up reading nothing mm -hmm. about the person. And what I tried very hard to do in Lola Bensky was paint the truest portrait I could of the people that I was focusing on. And I think that being alone in Mick Jagger's apartment um, enabled me to have a conversation with him about the most unlikely, unlikely subjects. I mean, he was thinking about health food and what he ate at a time when nobody thought about what they ate. 
and he was very serious and very interested in my story. Um, you talked to him about morality. Yes, because he was he was talking about morality because I was asking him, did he see a link between violence and sex and rock music and I, I knew nothing about violence or sex so why on earth I asked the question I have no idea <laughs> but he was talking about morality and saying that his generation didn't have to worry about prosperity for the first time in many years and therefore was free to think about moral values I mean he's a very very smart guy and a very very nice person, at least he was when he was young, I'm sure he still is, and when he said that, uh, he said you can't worry about morality on an empty stomach, and Lola said to him, my mother, who was in Nazi death camp, and my mother had just atrocious things done to her, and that's apart from all the people she loved in the universe being murdered, for my mother, it was really important that she survive as a human being. She used to say to me as a child, um, it's not enough to survive, you have to survive as a human being. So my mother was skeletal and was thinking about moral values. And when I was a child, I didn't really understand what it meant to survive as a human being because I thought, well, you can't survive as a zebra or a giraffe. You've got to be a human being. Um, but my mother in many ways was one of the reasons why I think rock journalism and journalism in general suited me because my mother used to say to me, you will never, ever, ever know what people are capable of. And it always frightened me, but I knew that she really, really did know. And I always wanted to know and I wanted to ask so many questions and there were so many questions that I couldn't ask and so many questions that were unanswerable in my house. This is, this is uh, unfair, but uh, it was, was, you mean questions that you couldn't ask your parents? Yes. Right, yeah. Um, yes. Was there a question that you regret not having asked one of your subjects? If you could do that over again, would you... No, because I had what were surprisingly satisfying and very illuminating interviews with the people I most cared about. I interviewed a lot of a lot of groups, hundreds and hundreds of groups, um, and most of them my you know I'm one of the few people who can say Dave D. Dozy Beakim. Beaky, Mick and Titch, mostly without stumbling. You know, they were an English rock group that few Americans have heard of, I'm sure. Or the Trogs, who first recorded Wild Thing, who I went on tour with. I, I never bothered about getting great interviews, or I've tried with everybody, but the people that I really focused on, you know, um, like Cher, Mick Jagger, Mama Cass, I really felt I had no, I just got to know them in a way that was very satisfying for me. And no, it didn't leave me um, wanting to ask anything else. I asked so many questions. I always went to interviews with pages and pages of them out of a fear of running out mm. and never sort of got to most of them. Mm. You, you, however, didn't only believe uh, or didn't only experience the, the pleasant side. Uh, you, you also right in the book, uh, my favorite scene, is when Lola goes to an early concert by The Doors. Uh, what was that like? It was here in New York. Um, where <laughs> and everybody was telling me that The Doors were going to be the next best, you know, the next big thing. And I, ha I had the good fortune to have an Australian journalist called Lillian Roxon um, mentor me and she introduced me to everybody who was anybody at Max's Kansas City as Australia's best journalist while I stuttered behind her. No, no, not really. <laughs> and Linda Eastman's, Linda Rock, Lillian Roxon's best friend was Linda Eastman who became Linda McCartney. So Linda, Lillian and I, <laughs> Lily, all went <laughs> to see The Doors together and um, I interviewed Jim Morrison afterwards and I found him terrifying, 
terrifyingly detached and cold. He really frightened me. Uh, I felt that he had these blue-grey eyes and I felt they weren't attached to a heart or a soul. And most people couldn't understand why I felt that. He swayed around on stage and he looked like a snake and poisonous to me. But he was, he was pretty unpleasant and he told me all these things about smearing dog shit over his brother's <laughs> face and he couldn't <laughs> stop laughing when he told me. And it didn't strike me as funny and then he talked about how much he hated his mother and he had just a lot of hatred in him and he tried to quote poetry in between these lines about how much he hated his mother. In fact, he did a concert in Washington at which his parents came to. He didn't speak to them, um, but he'd agreed that they could come to this concert. And he sang this line while staring vacantly at his m mother. Mother, I want to fuck you. Yeah, it's a bit stunning, isn't it? So... I, I, he just gave me the creeps. I, I was more frightened of him than anyone else I met. I mean, I, I was could tolerate being in changing rooms and having guys in bands drop their trousers because they, I don't know why they thought they had to drop them then, just because they were in their dressing room, probably just to embarrass me. Um, but nothing really fazed me. And a friend of mine who's here tonight said to me, maybe five or six years ago, she said, I couldn't have done that job as a rock journalist because my sexuality would have gone, got in the way. And I spent months and months worrying about where my sexuality was. Because <laughs> it didn't get in the way. And <laughs> Lily, I, I have uh, about a million more questions, but I think it's time to open up the conversation. Yeah, do we have any audience questions? We can probably take a few before we I move will on answer, to signing. I'll answer anything. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, I remember reading you in Go Set, but I also remember watching you on TV, and I, so I just want to know in here, is Molly Meldrum in the book? No, Molly Meldrum is an Australian television personality who I worked with and we did a national television program together four hours live once a week, all about rock music. <laughs> and I interviewed rock stars and reviewed records and M Molly Meldrum took it very, very seriously. And I used to give the records good reviews if I thought the musicians were nice people. <laughs> And <laughs> bad reviews if I thought they weren't. <laughs> That's how professional I was. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? I guess it's kind of an obvious question, but um, and maybe it's difficult to answer, but I'm curious. What is the difference between Lily and Lola? Oh, there's quite a lot of difference, and I didn't get confused at all. Um, my long-term Australian editor, who's somewhere here tonight, always calls me LB, and I called Lola Bensky LB, but I knew exactly which LB I was talking about, not me. You know, the, the thing that we both did is we both worked as rock journalists and I did interview everybody that I wrote about, um, but it is a book of fiction, even though I didn't change people's names. And th there is always is a difference. There's always a difference between my lead characters and me. You know, I think I would be much more boring. Um, did you ever consider writing it as a memoir? I did, I did. And I thought about it a lot and I thought um, it's too complicated to, it, it, this gives me a greater scope. Like when I wrote about Cher, and Sonny and Cher, I'm so thrilled she's still alive because the chapter on everyone's death, so there's one chapter on all the people who died and I felt that was as illuminating as the many chapters on their lives because the way they behaved in death and their manner of dying and their wills w were to me uh, just very, very illuminating. Um, what was the question, Leo? I think I think you've answered it. I think it. I've answered yeah. it. Huh? I think yeah. we have time for one last audience question. 
Anyone else? I'd like to ask you, uh, are there any uh, musicians performing today that you'd like to interview in their guise as performers now? Well, there are two people. The first one is Mick Jagger. I would really, really be interested because I think he's managed his life rather well. And, you know, from a distance, he seems to have. And so I would love to talk to him about the difference between him when he was in his 20s and him now. And there is one other person on my first day in my job as a journalist, um, which I had to get because my mother insisted I had to get a job because what I was doing up to then was riding round in circles in their very small backyard on my bike trying to lose weight. <laughs> and she didn't think that was anything one should do with one's life <laughs> full time. So the, on my first day at the newspaper, Bob Dylan was in town and they said to me, um, you, you have to go and interview Bob Dylan and I'd never even seen the tape recorder let alone worked out how to use it. I had no idea what questions to ask and for the first and only time in my whole career I said no and I didn't know that I was going to fall madly in love with a man who is so in love with Bob Dylan. Nobody else much really impresses him. You know I can't impress him with anybody I've met but he would kill to know more about Bob Dylan. So if I ever got the chance, <laughs> I would jump at it. <laughs> all right, well, I think that's about all we've got time for tonight. Thank you so much, Lily and Leo, for coming out. Um,